It is Wednesday, November 9th, 2022, and we're here tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin, to study the book of Genesis. We'll be looking at Genesis chapter 23 tonight in just a few minutes, so I would invite you to take a Bible and be turning with me to Genesis chapter 23, but we're glad that you've joined us tonight, and we also want to invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for a Bible study, and then at 10.30 for worship as well. And if you have any questions about what you hear or see in tonight's class, uh, give a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. We would love to hear from you. And any feedback or any questions or concerns, uh, please give us a call or send an email, fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. Tonight we are back to the book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings written primarily by Moses. And we've been studying the life of Abraham over the past several weeks. Uh, last week in Genesis chapter 22, you may remember that God tested Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And Abraham, of course, passed that test. And tonight we come to the death of Sarah, the death of Sarah in Genesis chapter 23. I want to give you a little heads up that this chapter is quite a bit shorter than most of the chapters in Genesis. But let's just jump right into it tonight by looking at Genesis chapter 23. And our first paragraph tonight comes in Genesis 23 verses 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 23 verses 1 and 2. Now Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So we find here that Sarah dies at the age of 127. And I think this reminds us that the lifespans continue to decrease in the book of Genesis. You may remember we started this book a number of months ago with Adam and Eve living into their 900s, and now we are down to just over 100 years. So we're getting a lot closer uh, to the average lifespan today. But uh, Sarah, though, dies at the age of 127. I would also point out, as we think about the lifespans here, that there seems to be a chance that Abraham and Shem, the son of Noah, might have actually run into each other. And that's something we don't really think about. But when we look at a chart of the lifespans, if we were to put them in chart form, kind of in a bar graph or something like that, uh, Shem, the son of Noah, seems to have lived long enough to have been alive at some point during the life of Abraham. And again, we sometimes miss that. Kind of bizarre to think about. But uh, Sarah, though, we find here in this chapter, dies at the age of 127. Uh, by this time, Abraham and Sarah are back in Hebron in the land of Canaan. So they have moved back north after their time down in Beersheba, which was on the border. And we find here that Abraham mourns. And he weeps for Sarah, his wife. These two have been together for many years now. They have been on many uh, <laughs> excellent adventures, we might say. They've been through some things together. And this, by the way, is a, a, a reference, the, the first reference to mourning over a death in the Bible. Uh, we had a reference to weeping a few chapters ago with Hagar weeping over her son Ishmael suffering out there in the wilderness. Uh, but if I have calculated, if I have looked at this correctly, it seems to me this is the first reference to mourning over someone's death. So yet again, another first, another beginning in the book of Genesis. So let's continue tonight, moving along to the next paragraph. This is now Genesis chapter 23, verses 3 through 9. Genesis Chapter 23, verses 3 through 9. Then Abraham rose from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. Give me a burial site among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our graves. None of us will refuse you his grave for burying your dead. So Abraham rose and bowed to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. And he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish for me to bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and approach Ephron the son of Zohar for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah which he owns, which is at the end of his field, 
For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence for a burial site. So after a period of mourning, Abraham gets up, and now he has to find a burial place for Sarah. Remember, he's traveling now. He really doesn't have a a home that would be considered his own by any normal means. And so he talks to the locals. He talks to the sons of Heth, where he happens to be at the moment. And he explains that he's pretty much passing through. And remember, Hebrew, that word Hebrew means a wanderer, one who crosses over lines, a trespasser in a sense. So he's he's traveling through here. And I don't think this text really means that he wants Sarah out of sight as if he's trying to hide her in some way, not as if he's trying to forget about her some way, like make her go away, not that kind of thing. But it just seems to be a case of uh, Abraham not wanting to carry her body around, perhaps, as he continues to travel. And so he needs somewhere to put the body. He needs a place to bury the dead. And so here the sons of Heth recognize that Abraham is a very powerful man. And we've discussed this before. He is wealthy. He has a large a household, a number of servants, flocks, herds, all that kind of thing, a lot of wealth, a number of tents. And so these people basically offer Abraham the best of the best. So wherever you want to bury your dead, go for it. What's ours is yours. In fact, we'll give you the choicest of our graves. And they speak for the entire group. In terms of a, a burial place, anything that any of us own, it is now yours. And notice in verse 7, uh, Abraham is obviously touched by this. He's, he is impressed, it seems. And so he bows down as this expression of thanksgiving. So he recognizes this offer that they're making. And then notice that he has a request. He's got his eye on the cave of Machpelah, on the land of Ephron, the son of Zohar. So he wants this cave, which is down there at the end of this guy's field. But he wants to fit, pay full price for it. So I think... What's going on here is Abraham is not a charity case. He doesn't want to be considered the recipient of somebody's gift. And he wants to buy the property. He wants the deed to it. He wants to pay full price. Nobody's holding anything over his head. This is not something that's going to be taken away on a whim and, you know, maybe have access cut off at some point in the future. But he wants to pay full price so that he can have this land permanently. So let's continue then, see what happens next. This is Genesis 23 verses 10 through 16. Genesis 23, verses 10 through 16. Now Ephron was sitting among the sons of Heth. And Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the sons of Heth, even of all who went in at the gate of his city, saying, No, my lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the presence of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. And Abraham bowed before the people of the land, he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you will only please listen to me, I will give the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. Then Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth four hundred shekels of silver, what is that between me and you? So bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, commercial standard. Starting in verse 10, we find that Ephron is actually in the audience among the sons, or uh, the people of the gate, uh, the old guys, as we've mentioned this before, hanging out, kind of solving all the world's problems. This is where this goes down. And so uh, Ephron is actually there, and he hears this as Abraham makes this offer. And, and Ephron, I think, very generously offers to give this land and the cave to Abraham. And in response, Abraham bows down again and repeats his willingness to pay full price for it. I want to pay full price. And I love what happens next. Instead of saying, okay, go ahead and pay me, that's not what he does, at least not in a direct kind of way, but instead, Ephron basically says, um, don't worry about it. You know, I don't want a piece of land that's that's only worth 400 shekels of silver to come between us. And so I kind of almost laugh out loud reading that. He basically names a price without actually naming a price, if you see what's going on there. And so Abraham then ends up paying for the land right there on the spot in front of this crowd of people um, that had gathered. And I find it interesting that there's no dickering, there's no uh, going back and forth over this, and I think there is probably something to that. And I think we've talked about this in the fairly recent past, but, you know, paying for a meal, 
when you go out to eat with friends, at least for me, and I've said this before, it can be one of the most awkward of all human interactions. Um, I hate that. Arguing with a group of people over who pays for dinner. You know, I want to take you. No, I want to pay for it. No, let me take the check tonight and all that kind of thing. And so I would just repeat, if I offer to take you out for lunch, then please let me take you out to lunch. And if you offer to take me out for lunch, I need to let you take me out for lunch. I think I, we would agree as, of course, Jesus said, it is better to give than to receive. And so if I want the blessing of giving, um, I would ask, please let me do it. <laughs> and I will do the best I can to let you have the same blessing if this was your idea and if you wanted to take me or my family out. And so, I mean, if we just take care of our own, if we you know, come to some mutual agreement before we head out somewhere, that's fine as well. Um, but I just hate the back and forth over that. I don't know, maybe some of you enjoy that. I I'd absolutely do not. But I've noticed though through the years that people will often have a hard time being on the receiving end of a blessing. And that goes for me as well. And I know we talked about this maybe a year ago, kind of the idea of a lasagna. You know, if you want to drop off a lasagna, I'll let you do it. And in the same way, if I want to do that for you, please let me do it because it's good for me to be able to do that. It is good to be able to give. And I think we see that right here in Genesis 23. Abraham wants to pay full price for a piece of land. Ephron wants to give it. Abraham insists on paying for it. So there's that back and forth there, but ultimately Ephron allows Abraham to pay. And maybe that was part of his negotiation strategy from the beginning. I don't know. Um, just a quick note or two on the price here before we move on. Some of the commentaries suggest that 400 shekels of silver is way more than this land could possibly be worth. Uh, that Abraham is really being taken advantage of here. That's a lot of the speculation out there based on the, the price of it. Uh, one commentary suggested that the annual wage of an average worker at that time was only 10 shekels. So think about that. If an annual your annual salary is 10 shekels, the price of this land was 400 shekels. I mean, that's many years of an annual wage. And so for a, a field with a cave, that it just kind of doesn't seem right. It, it kind of seems like they're taking advantage of Abraham here. Uh, one commentary suggested, um, or I guess gave the reminder that David purchased the threshing floor of Aruna and the oxen for the sacrifice for 50 shekels of silver. That's over in uh, 2 Samuel 24, 24. Uh, Jeremiah purchased a field from his cousin for 17 shekels of silver over in Jeremiah 32, 9. And so I'm just saying 400 shekels seems to be incredibly expensive. So I don't know what's happening. Either they're taking advantage of Abraham or Abraham is going above and beyond. Um, but whatever the case is, Abraham's kind of in a spot here. And, you know, you go to find a burial place for your family, you, you're you kind of at the mercy of whoever's selling the cemetery plots. You kind of don't have too many options at this point. And so he's got the silver. The money is really not an issue for this man. So he makes the decision to do this, knowing that God has promised his descendants all of this land at some point in the future. So I think if we think about it in that way, perhaps Abraham is thinking this is his down payment, so to speak. He now owns an actual piece of the promised land. And this is, my understanding, the first land that Abraham actually owns in this area. He's been traveling, traveling, traveling. He left Ur, obviously, many years ago, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, but now he seems to actually own a piece of the promised land. So in that sense... Yeah, maybe he's being taken advantage of, but then again, maybe he sees this as important. He has a burial place for his wife, and he also now has his foot in the door. He also now has this actual piece of land. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 23, verses 17 through 20. Genesis 23, 17 through 20. So Ephron's field, which was in Machpelah, which faced Mamre, the field and cave which was in it, and all the trees which were in the field that were within all the confines of its border were deeded over to Abraham for a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field at Machpelah, facing Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded over to Abraham for a burial site by the sons of Heth. 
In verses 17 through 20, we basically have the paperwork. Uh, we have a description of the land. And as I understand from doing some reading on this, it was very common at that time and place in that culture to list the trees. So you would specify that there are a certain number of trees involved in the sale of this property. So we've got a description of the land. We have a reference to some kind of deed being transferred. We've got a reference to the witnesses. And then we have Abraham burying his wife, Sarah. And again, we just need to remember this is the first land that Abraham actually owns in the promised land. So he's traveled for well over 60 years now since leaving his home in Ur. And he now owns an actual piece of it. It's a grave site. And in a sense, this is a leap of faith. And I would kind of emphasize here that Abraham does not bury Sarah back in Ur. That would have been a common thing back then, to go back to your homeland to bury your people, but he does not do that. Uh, this is his homeland. So he, she, he makes sure that she's buried in the land that God has promised, even if this little plot is all that he owns. Well, as we close here at the end of Sarah's life, I want to point out, as we wrap up her life, I want to point out that Sarah is listed as a woman of faith over in Hebrews chapter 11. So you, it's on the screen. You may want to turn there. It's up to you. But uh, just, just want to not forget this. In the Hall of Fame of God's Faithful over in Hebrews chapter 11, God obviously mentions Abraham. But Sarah is mentioned in there as well. And I should also point out something I almost failed to mention. I believe that uh, Sarah is either the first or maybe the only woman to have her age at death recorded. And so some of the commentaries, we need to, you know, fact check me on that, check into that. But some of the commentaries were pointing out um, that that is rather significant, that she was a significant person, especially as a woman, to have the age at death recorded. So if you find another age at death for a woman, let me know. But uh, so I'm not swearing to that. But that was one thing that several of the commentaries pointed out, that this was rather significant. If not the only time, it was one of just a small handful. But uh, this is Hebrews chapter 11. Notice verses 11 through 16. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And then with the immediate context here, in the life of Sarah, notice the author of Hebrews continues in verse 13, and he says, All these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So Sarah then dies without receiving the promises. She lived in faith, and she never really received her reward in this life. But the author of Hebrews points out that she was looking beyond this life. She wasn't looking here. She was looking to something in the next life. So in this life, Sarah lived as a stranger in an exile on this earth. So kind of as a thought question, I, I would ask, how many of you women would appreciate leaving your home at the age of 65 and living in a tent for the rest of your life. Living in a tent, traveling from one place to another over the next 62 years. And then in the middle of that, having a baby at the age of 90. I don't know too many who would sign up for that. But Sarah was looking for a better country. This world was not her home. She was looking for a heavenly country. And so I'm just saying that Sarah, in addition to Abraham, both of these are, are given as examples of great faith in Hebrews chapter 11. So again, Abraham, the father of the faithful, but Sarah also played a huge role in this. Before we close tonight, I also want to point out that Sarah is lifted up in scripture as an example of a godly wife as well. Over in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter gives some advice to women whose husbands may be a bit difficult to live with. Not that any of us are difficult to live with, 
But here is some special advice to wives whose husbands may be difficult to live with. And I'll read the passage. Uh, but I don't think it's too much to read into this that perhaps even Abraham might have been a little bit difficult at times. I mean, obviously moving when he was 65 and she was about uh, 65, he, he was 75, she was 65. I mean, that right there is kind of <laughs> a picture of a difficult husband. Hey, honey, let's move when you're at that age from one place to another, living in tents and all of that. In addition to that, we have Abraham telling Sarah to basically deceive foreign kings explaining that she's his sister so he's putting her in a difficult spot and, and so on so this is first peter 3 1 through 6. peter says in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. So let's notice here, Sarah was submissive to Abraham, but it almost sounds like Peter is describing her as fearless because Sarah was really being obedient, not just to Abraham, but to God. And I mention this only because we've looked at the death of Sarah tonight, a great hero of the faith. She lived, I think we can assume based on this passage, with a, a kind of difficult man, and yet she was faithful to God uh, through it. Uh, this brings us to the end of chapter 23 of Genesis. Next week, we hope to come back together to look at chapter 4 as Abraham, now a widower, goes out to help find a, a wife for Isaac. And with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930 as we continue our study of Isaiah. And then after class on Sunday, we plan on coming together for our worship assembly at 1030. So let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we praise you for your amazing promises. The promise of salvation, the promise of a life after this one, and the promise that we will indeed live with you forever. And tonight we pray for the faith of Sarah, who lived most of her life looking for something that she never found in this life. Like Sarah, we are also strangers and exiles on this earth, and we pray that you would be with us. We pray for greater faith. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, come quickly. Amen.